All right, if you could turn in your Bibles once again, please, to the book of Ezekiel, and uh, we're going to be reading from chapter 17 this morning and uh, verse 16 to verse 24 to the end of the chapter, and in the will of the Lord, we'll uh, perhaps even get into chapter 18 this morning, but just uh, for reading purposes, we'll read from verse 16. So it says this, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he break, even with him in the midst of Babylon he shall die. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons, seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when, lo, he had given his hand, and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised, and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, and will plead with him there for his trespass that he hath trespassed against me. And all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. It, I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon an high mountain and eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell." And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So uh, we've been talking about this uh, rebellion of King Zedekiah uh, against the uh, agreement that he had made uh, with Nebuchadnezzar and how he had looked to Egypt for help and the resultant judgment that would come because of that, because he broke the oath and the importance of keeping oaths. So that's kind of the context. But in the Q&A last week, we had been talking about a previous king because he had been mentioned in this chapter, and that was uh, King Jehoiakim. And one of the things that we observed was that there was an apparent contradiction between the account of Jehoiakim in the book of Kings and the account of Jehoiakim in the book of Chronicles. And so we, uh, I, I didn't have an answer at that time. And uh, so we want to answer that because it is interesting that there are these alleged discrepancies in the scriptures that have caused some to question the whole authenticity and authority of the Bible. And so we, we do need to look at some of these things. Now, uh, let me just read the two portions um, that are uh, under consideration here, where there is this apparent contradiction, and then uh, we'll seek with the Lord's help to give a, a satisfactory um, explanation. So I want to go, first of all, to Second Kings, the book of Second Kings. And we look at chapter 24, 2 Kings 24, where we read this statement in 2 Kings 24, verse 8. It uh, simply says this. It says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan, of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So there we have 18 years old when he began to reign, reigned in Jerusalem for three months. Okay, I'd like us to look now to Second Chronicles, 
chapter 36. And this is where the apparent contradiction comes in. <clears throat> In verse 9, it says, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, the two, two differences there. First of all, uh, King says 18. Chronicle says eight years old when he began to reign. And then it tells us he reigned three months. Both of them say he reigned three months in Jerusalem. But in this case, it says three months and 10 days. And so we want to just kind of address those things. Now, the most common way that modern scholarship deals with these kind of things is, is this phrase, oh, it was a scribal error, or a copious error. And so what they will do is they'll say it really should read 18 in both cases. And so if you look at the Darby translation, Mr. Darby, a man who I respect greatly and certainly knows Greek a lot better than I do and Hebrew and all the rest of it, he says it should be 18 in both cases. But in the Masoretic text from which the King James Old Testament comes from, it does say 18 in one and eight in the other. So how do we deal with this? And so, and again, I have to say, I am never happy with the argument, it's a copyist error. And the reason I say that is that uh, these uh, copyists of scripture were very, very careful. If there was even one mistake, they would just rip up the whole thing and start all over again. They counted letters, they counted words. They, accuracy was there, the, the name of the game. And so I, I, I feel, it, feel it's a very, in my mind, a cop-out to say that. And I think there, there are some good explanations so we we might want to uh, ask the question how do we how do we reconcile these things the 18 year old uh it says how do we reconcile jehoiakim being 18 years old when he became king with the second scripture which says he was eight years old so going back to prior to um the advent of higher criticism so we're looking at commentaries that existed before higher criticism became the fad in the 1880s. Uh, and uh, and it really did become a fad, which still dominates a lot of Chris Christianity today. So here's a, a Puritan commentator called Matthew Poole. And uh, of course, we're going to cite some others as well. And this is what they say. Here's the answer to this discrepancy. He says, both ages are true. In his eighth year, Jehoiakim began to reign with his father as a co-regent who made him king with him as other kings of Israel and Judah had done in the like times of trouble. And in his 18th year, he reigned alone. Okay, so in his 18th year, he began to reign without his father. And then he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And of course, it says three months or three months and 10 days. Well, that's an easy one to deal with, you see. So if you would ask me, uh, how old am I? I'd say, well, I'm 64. But if you wanted a more precise answer, I would say, well, I'm actually 64, but that was in July. So I'm 64 and <laughs> so many days. And I'm, I can't count the days because keep adding days every day. So, But you get the, the idea. Uh, so, so certainly he reigned three months uh, in round figures, precisely three months, 10 days. And so that would be the explanation that would be very satisfying to me. Now, I'm not, it's not just Matthew Poole. Uh, this is the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary. At the age of eight, the father took him into partnership in the government. Second Chronicles 36, 9, he began to reign alone at 18. So just basically a co-regent until he reigned alone. And uh, this is uh, this is kind of an interesting comment. And I just want to read this before it says it is never satisfactory solution to simply put discrepancies down to a copyist error since the Masoretic scribes in God's providential preservation were most meticulous in their work. Our high view of Holy Scripture leads us to say with John Newton. Remember John Newton, the amazing grace author, he says, I will put down all apparent inconsistencies in the Bible to my own ignorance until I find a solution. <laughs> I like that. And I'm going to go with that. So there we go. That's the, that answers that. And uh, we just want to move back now into our passage in Ezekiel, uh, hopefully satisfying 
those that are going to listen to this, and we'll get back into chapter 17, Ezekiel chapter 17. And and so, uh, again, this idea of the oath, I want you just to notice, I think we, we did uh, up to verse 17 last time. Uh, so uh, I want you just to notice verse 18. It says, seeing he despised the oath by, uh, by breaking, this is chapter 17, verse 18, by breaking the covenant, when lo, he had given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. So he's emphasizing that he he had given uh, this oath and he'd shaken on it. So, he, he, you know, he was very much committed to this covenant. And because he failed to keep the covenant, God says he shall not escape. Now, what's even more significant is the very next verse, verse 19. He says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as I live. And notice what God says now. Surely mine oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he hath broken even it will i recompense on his own head and so the, the thought is this god regarded it not only as an oath to nebuchadnezzar but to him also the implication of this is far-reaching it indicates that agreements entered into and obligations incurred by worshipers of god are as binding as if they had been made with God in person. And he actually did swear in the name of the Lord when he made this oath. That's what Chronicles 36 tells us, that he did it in the name of the Lord. And so as a result of that, he says, I will recompense upon his own head. I will spread my net upon him and he shall be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon. Of course, we know that Nebuchadnezzar did it, but Nebuchadnezzar was God's net, God's instrument. For, for judging Zedekiah, taking him uh, into Babylon. And of course, we know the story how he had uh, killed his sons before his eyes, and then he had put out the eyes of uh, Zedekiah. So the last thing he saw was the death of his sons, and he was taken uh, into captivity. And he ultimately died in, in Babylon. That was the, the end of his, uh, his fate. And so this is what God is saying, because he says that he has trespassed against me. I will plead with him there in Babylon for his trespass. So, of course, this blind king in Babylon, not too much distractions. You can't see anything. But God is going to plead with him there for his trespass that he hath trespassed against me. In other words, God's Holy Spirit was going to bring home to this man's heart what he had done in not keeping the oath that he had taken. And so he'd have a lot of time to think about it there in captivity in Babylon. And so this is God's judgment upon him. Uh, <clears throat> why were they being judged? You see, that remember the, the context here is that the previous chapter had talked about all the previous sins of Judah. So the present generation uh, was saying, well, why should we be judged because of the conduct of our forefathers? And so he's showing them the present sin of the nation, uh, which was Zedekiah's failure to, as leader to keep his covenant. So why were they being judged for all the past sins of their nation? Uh, it was not fair. That's what they're saying. Ezekiel is responding, declaring they would be judged for the contemporary lack of trust in the Lord which they had shown by their tendency to rely on Egypt for security and by the corruption of their regent Zedekiah. Well, twofold, they're looking to Egypt for help, but God always condemns his people when they look to Egypt for help because it's, it's an exchange. Instead of looking to him, they're looking to Egypt, which is a type, a picture of the world for help. Rather than him, God always is slighted by that. And again, in the church, uh, we would say by practical implication, if we look to the world for help, that is worldly methodology, right, for success, it's a slight on the character of God. It's saying, God, you can't do this, but but these worldly techniques, uh, that, that's what's going to solve all our problems. And I suspect that the Lord would have something to say to much of contemporary Christianity, which is very much looking to worldly methods and ideologies to uh, do things. But then the second thing is because their leadership failed to keep a covenant agreement that they had made in the name of the Lord. 
And that's a very solemn thing. So as plainly as he could declare it, Ezekiel showed that Judah's political disaster was traceable to moral weakness and deceit. When once the hand was given uh, as a token of agreement, that word should have been all the bond needed. It should have been kept. And again, we, we mentioned last time, and again, it's good application for us. Am I a man of my word? If I, you know, say I'm going to do something, can people say, okay, it'll be done? No, <laughs> he's given his word. And and so, and again, I think it's good, a good practical thing for us to say is, uh, Lord willing, I will do that. Because the things that happen that cause us not to be able to keep a, an agreement or, or uh, you know, so so we'd say, Lord willing, that, that my intention is to keep that fully. But we've got to be careful. Let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. That's what the word of God says. Now, what's lovely about this chapter is that it has a very encouraging epilogue in verses 22 through 24. Because as we think about it, the 20th king of Judah dies blinded in Babylon. And so some might be asking the question, is this it then? Is this the end of the Davidic line? The royal line of the house of Judah, the 20th king, basically dies blinded in Babylon. What about the Davidic covenant? What about the covenant that God made with David? And I want you just to go back with me to Psalm 89, which is a beautiful psalm of the Davidic covenant. And it's got some, some very important things to say uh, that I think are very relevant uh, today. Uh, so, for instance, Psalm 89 and verse 34, he says this. Um, <clears throat> well, let's just read from verse 33. Uh, uh, ver let's go back to verse 32. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity, iniquity with stripes. And so God's promising that he will discipline uh, the uh, descendants of David if they're wayward. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. So in contrast to the last king of Judah, who was a covenant breaker, God says, the covenant that I have made with David, I am not going to break it. In fact, he says uh, in verse uh, 35, once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David. Oh, wow. What? A, what? So God is, is, is swearing by his holiness, his very holy character. He says, I'll put on the line here. Uh, uh, I'm not going to lie to David. His seed, his descendants shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me, it shall be established forever as the moon and as uh, uh, and as a faithful witness in heaven sila so the sun and moon their existence is proof that god still is going to keep his promise to the house of david that a descendant of david is going to sit on the throne forever now let's go a step further let's just look in jeremiah just for a second i want you to look at jeremiah 31 and uh, again, this idea of God's plans for the nation of Israel. This, you, know, you know, there are those in the church that believe that God has finished with Israel. He has no purposes for Israel. Uh, they're set aside permanently in the purposes of God. The church is the new Israel. Uh, this is very popular teaching and growing teaching uh, in the church today. Um, and again, I think false teaching, I believe with all my heart, is false teaching. God has not finished with Israel. Now, they're temporarily set aside in the purposes of God, but he is going to fulfill his oaths, his covenants, with not only the house of David, but with the nation of Israel. And so if you notice verse 35 of Jeremiah 31, it says, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea 
when the waters thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, in other words, if the sun and moon end, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So again, he still has a plan for them because, the, you know, oh, driving back from our midweek Bible reading on Wednesday night, there was a beautiful harvest moon, a full moon in Missouri. And so it's still there in the sky. At least it was there Wednesday night. It's too cloudy here in Ontario for me to have seen it last night, but it was definitely there on Wednesday night in Missouri. And so he says, the seed of Israel also shall uh, are not going to cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. So he said, if somebody could truly measure the whole of heaven, and we're trying, and we got bigger satellites, but we're a long way from measuring heaven itself or the heavens. So God is committed to this nation. So let's go back now, keeping that in mind, to Ezekiel 17. And so we've got this dilemma here. It seems like the, the, the lineage of the house of David is in a terrible state. The, last, the 20th king of Judah dies uh, blinded in Babylon. Verse 22, thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon an high mountain and eminent. So no eagle is mentioned now. I want you to notice that. In the previous, it was eagles that were taking shoots and putting them in different places. No, two eagles that were involved. Now it's no longer an eagle. It's God saying, I will. The sovereign Lord is saying, I will take of the highest branch of the high cedar, and will set it, and I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. So no eagle, the sovereign Lord is going to do it. He's going to take the highest branch of the high cedar, and I will set it up. It's a tender one, and will plant it on a high mountain. So what does all that mean? I want to suggest to you an, an eminent mountain. Turn with me back to the Psalms and Psalm 2. And verse six, beautiful psalm, and it's uh, it's all about opposition to the anointed one, the Messiah. And uh, in verse, uh, well, let's just kind of read the, the the first few verses. Why do the heathen rage, and the people? So the heathen is the 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 Gentile nations. The people would be the nation of Israel. Imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, their rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. That word anointed is charisma, it's the Messiah, against the Lord and his Messiah, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. Basically, modern version of that based on the New Testament would be, we will not have this man to reign over us. The nations say, we do not want Christ to reign over us. So this is God's response. I love this. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Don't you just love that? Here's man. We're not going to have this man to reign over us. And here's God just laughing at the very suggestion that man could ever frustrate the purposes of God. And so it says, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And then this is our verse. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And what's interesting is he, he deals with it as if it's already happened. It's the prophetic present here. It's so certain that God will set his king on the holy hill of Zion that God writes it as if it's already happened. And I can guarantee you that there is a day coming when Jesus Christ, our Lord, will reign over the entire world from Mount Zion. Because God's word has said it. <laughs> and no man can stop it. No man can frustrate it. No human schemes or human cleverness can ever stop what God intends to do. And so we're in the realm now of messianic prophecy. 
presenting with a much more positive note, a promise of future blessing in the Messiah. And so God is going to take of the highest branch of the high cedar. Again, speaking of, uh, of the nation of Judah, I'm going to set it. I'll crop off the top of this young twig, a tender one. So he talks about this descendant of David who will be a tender one is none other than the Messiah, the son of David. Now, let's again look at some scriptures and just keep in mind this idea of this branch, this taken off, this, this how, how does the, the word use it here? Uh, yeah, I'll take off, off the highest branch of the high cedar, set it, I will crop off from the top of his young twigs, a tender one. So again, this is God's plan. So let's just look at some scriptures, lovely scriptures. Isaiah 11, 1. It says this, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay, so a descendant of David, you know, David's father was Jesse. So a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. Because then it goes on, it says the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Of course, it's clearly messianic. And uh, it talks about him, verse 4, with righteousness, he'll judge the poor, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it talks about the millennial earth, uh, cow and the bear feeding together, young ones lying down together, the lion eating straw with the ox, and so on and so forth. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Very, very beautiful uh, chapter, verse 10. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which will stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. But speaking of the um, kingdom of Messiah, let's look at some more references. Jeremiah 23 to this idea, this shoot, this branch, this tender one coming out of the descendants of David, out of the uh, that dynasty, that family. Jeremiah 23 Verse 5 and 6, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah sit can you. What a wonderful, wonderful Thing. The good shepherd will replace the worthless shepherds of Israel, and he will reign on the earth. Jeremiah 33 and verse 15. Jeremiah 33, verse 15. And we read this, and in those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. For this saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, because that's going to be fulfilled in the Messiah. Zechariah chapter 6, and there's just so many of these, but they all fit together so beautifully. This is God's eternal plan. This is what he's going to do. He's going to set his king on his holy hill of Zion. Zechariah 6 and verse 12, he says this, says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, that's uh, the temple that we're, we read of in the book of Ezekiel, we're going to get to that. There's going to be a, a tremendous section from chapter 40 through 48, where the, the what we call the millennial temple, he will build the temple of the Lord. And it says, uh, he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And then final one. Revelation chapter 22, giving clear identification of who we're speaking about. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root 
and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Who, who is this tender branch, this, this root that's going to come out of the rotten stump of the house of David? Well, Jesus says, I am. <laughs> that's, it's me. I am the one that's going to fulfill all these things. So in contrast to Zedekiah, uh, this one is planted of the Lord and will be fruitful and be a goodly cedar, not a creeping vine. Creeping vine, kind of a, that's the idea of a, a kingdom of low uh, value, but this kingdom is going to be an exalted kingdom. And of course, it's going to be the Lord Jesus that is going to be reigning. And so, uh, as we said, this is Ezekiel's version of the great prophecy of Isaiah 11.1, 1, this coming forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch growing out of his roots. And so God promised to bring wonderful and productive growth, and, and so much so uh, that we, we, we read in verse 23, it says, In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit, and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. So uh, this is going to be a, an amazing kingdom, the kingdom of Messiah. And of course, it talks about the birds uh, it being in the branches. And so I want us to go back to the book of Daniel, or forward, actually, to Daniel <laughs> chapter 4. Of course, there's this... Uh, vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, and uh, it's of a great tree that was cut down. And in chapter 4, verse 12, we read this, the leaves thereof were, so verse, um, let me just go back, verse 10, there were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong. The height thereof reached to heaven. And the sight thereof to the end of all the earth, the leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh were fed of it. And then we get some uh, application to this in verse 21. It's uh, So verse 20, the tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong, whose height reached into the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwell, upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reaches to the heaven and the dominion to the end of the earth. And so basically... Uh, we have a picture here that we can interpret Ezekiel 17 based on what we saw in Daniel 4. And that is that, that the Babylonian Empire was a great empire of which other nations were fed as a result of it. So we already have seen that, haven't we? That Judah uh, was supported by Nebuchadnezzar and by Babylon while ever it kept his agreement. And there were other nations that were under, uh, as it were, the dominion of Nebuchadnezzar. So when it comes to this speaking of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, it gives a similar description of this tree with birds or fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches thereof. And so again, we're going to find that Messiah's kingdom, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed as a result of Messiah's earthly kingdom. And not only is it going to be blessed, um, they're going to be gathered to the Lord. And so I want you just to look back in Isaiah again now, Isaiah chapter 2. And again, all we're doing is comparing Scripture with Scripture, but we get an indication of the nations and what is going to happen uh, to the nations uh, when Messiah is king. And so it says, verse Isaiah 2, verse 2, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
He shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So amazing, isn't it? I, I don't know about you, but I just look forward so much to the day when Jesus Christ reigns on planet Earth. There'll be peace. Uh, the nations, instead of hating Israel, which is going on right now, uh, anti-Semiticism at an all-time high, the nations will flow into the land of Israel and say, teach us about your God. And, and what, a, what a day, a glorious day that is going to be. But it's only going to come about, not by the IDF or, or uh, Jewish great military and intelligence and all the rest of it, but it's only going to be brought about by Jesus Christ the Lord when he comes back to save that nation and then to set up this this glorious kingdom that will have no end. So in verse 24, it says, And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. So it's interesting, isn't it, how God loves to do this. He, he loves to exalt the low tree and bring down the high tree. And if, if you look at scripture, you'll see so many examples of that. You remember Joseph in the dungeon? <laughs> he was a low tree, and yet God exalted him and made him second only to Pharaoh, right? God just loves to exalt the humble. That's just the way he works. Uh, we see Israel in Egypt. They're slaves, and yet God brings them to this place where the Egyptians actually came and gave them their jewelry and all the rest of it and, and recognize that God was with them. We see David persecuted this low tree, but God exalted him and made him the high tree, and he became king over all Israel. It was so low that when Samuel was, was looking to, to anoint a new king, David was passed by. He was out looking after the sheep. They didn't even call him. And yet God exalts the low tree. And yet, of course, the most exam perfect example of that is the Lord Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, the one who humbled himself so low to become obedient, even the death, the death of the cross, God, he says, has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And by the way, just from a practical um, application of this, that if we want to be usable for the Lord, then God only uses the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So we have to take that same place, that lowly place. And so he talks about this low tree, but he also talks about a dry tree. And so he says, um, in, again, in verse 24, he says, I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. And so, again, we would say this, that the house of Israel had become, or the house of David had become a dry, rotten, corrupted stump. And Jesus, he is that, that that root out of dry ground, right? Out of this dry ground. One reference we, we didn't look at, but would have been very relevant in terms of the messianic aspects of the Lord Jesus, Isaiah 53, uh, one that we, we know so well. <clears throat> and... Um, Verse, verse 2, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that when we shall see him. Uh, there is no beauty that we should desire him, so on and so forth. So again, just that idea of the dry tree coming out here. So again, just amazing to think uh, of, of this chapter. Um, 
what a what a tremendous chapter it really is that um it begins uh with the dissolution basically of this uh kings of judah and it ends with an exaltation uh, of the coming king uh, who will come out of this corrupt lineage and set up a glorious kingdom that will last forever and ever so it's a great ending to chapter 17. Sometimes in Ezekiel, we've got to go through some pretty bleak stuff, uh, but it, he, 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 he rarely leaves us there. He usually has something positive at the end to kind of lift our spirits and encourage us. So now we, we're going to move on into chapter 18. And uh, just again, just kind of by way of review, in chapters 13 through 17, uh, we've seen God through Ezekiel tell them the reasons for the coming judgment on Jerusalem and on Judah. Now we want to deal with, in verse chapter 18, some objections to coming judgment. And then in chapter 19, a lamentation for coming judgment. So we're going to see uh, in chapter 19, particularly that Ezekiel uh, expresses the heart of God, the lamentation over this judgment that is to take place but chapter 18 is really a chapter about individual responsibility and the call to repentance individual responsibility and the call to repentance see what some of the exiles were saying was this it's not fair have you ever heard that before it seems to be in us from infancy doesn't it it's not fair some exiles were thinking, why, why should we be judged? This is how they're thinking. For the wickedness of our ancestors, that's chapter 16, and for the foolishness of our ruler, that's Zedekiah, who broke his covenant in chapter 17. In other words, it's never our fault. It's always somebody else's. Right. It's the problem is that our ancestors were evil. And then it's the problem that our present ruler is a fool. And so these are their excuses throughout human history since lucifer's accusation in the garden of eden men have thrown the questions of fairness in the face of god you see in the garden of eden it was god's not being fair you see he's he's keeping back from you this really good tree in the midst of the garden he's just not being fair and ever since then this this argument of god's not being fair has been thrown in the face of God. So Ezekiel is going to answer that each individual is responsible for his own sins. This chapter is also a wonderful treatise on repentance and what it looks like. So we find in the chapter the prophet directly answering erroneous statements that the Jewish exiles were making about God and their present circumstances. So I want you to notice, uh, for instance, in verse 2, what mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying? So again, notice it's what they're saying. They're using a proverb, they're saying this thing. So he's going to answer what they're saying. We'll talk about the proverb in a, in a little while. But look at chapter 18, verse uh, ni uh, 19, and you'll notice he says, Yet ye say, why? And so again, they're, they're arguing back. You're saying, uh, we see it again in verse 25. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. And then in verse 29, yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. So he's, he's basically uh, going to take up what they're saying, their objections, they're saying this, they're saying this. And so God is going to say, okay, this is what you're saying. Now listen to what I'm going to say. And of course, when God says something, what is he going to speak from? Well, verse one, the word of the Lord came to me again saying. So you've got God's word against what they are saying. Against their excuses, if you like. And so we're going to look particularly in this chapter at God's judgment being perfectly righteous despite their objections so the word of the lord comes to ezekiel the true and living word and it's been set against popular proverbs or cliches of the day 
So, for instance, again in verse 2, what mean you that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? So he's challenging this popular proverb that is in use. So the outline of the chapter is pretty straightforward. Verse 2 is the objection, this proverb that they're using. And verse 3 through 20 is the answer and the conclusion. So he says, again in verse 2, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. This is the popular proverb used among the children of Israel, both among those in captivity and those he uh, address, ones he addresses here, and also those in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is that Jeremiah mentions the same proverb. If you look at Jeremiah 31, we've been in there quite a bit here, but verse 29 through 30, we read this. It says, in those days, they shall say no more. So he's picturing a day when they won't be using this proverb anymore. In Ezekiel's time, they're still using it, but Jeremiah is predicting a day when they'll no longer use it. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. And so basically, again, the same concepts. Verse 7, it says, Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. And so basically what he's saying is, you know, we're, uh, they're, they're saying we're suffering, again, as a result of what our ancestors have done. So what is this proverb all about? Before we, we actually get into the details of it, let me just say this. It's a shame that the people of God were more eager to embrace a catchy proverb than giving heed to the infallible word of God that was spoken by the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah. They loved the, the, the proverbs, the cliches of the day more than they did the reasoned argument of the word of God. And so, again, um, what is this proverb? What does it mean? The fathers have eaten sour grape, the children's teeth are set on edge. So they're, they're charging God with injustice and displaying a spirit of pessimism at the same time. They said the eating of sour grapes by the fathers had blunted the teeth of the children. So although the children were not responsible, they were suffering for their actions of the fathers. So kind of the reasoning goes something like this. And, and, and again, there is, there is some measure of truth in this, that we are definitely affected by what our parents do. And so, for instance, if you uh, grow up um, in an environment where, um, for instance, your, uh, your, your mother is a chain smoker, is that going to affect the child? It definitely is, isn't it? especially during pregnancy. So, so the point is simple. That this idea of eating sour grapes by the fathers had blunted the teeth of the children. So basically they're saying the children are not responsible. They're suffering for the actions of the fathers. And certainly we would say that there's, there is this grain of truth. Fathers affect their children. Um, on righteousness and righteousness, um, they're saying basically are always inherited. So basically, if you've got a bad dad, you're going to be a bad child. Now, here's, here's the folly of all this. And the folly is that we're still responsible for our own actions. We may have had dysfunctional families. And there are many born into this world with dysfunctional families. However, what we could say is this, that it doesn't take away the fact that we're still responsible for our own actions. And we do not have to be defined by our upbringing. It certainly influences us, but we don't, it doesn't have to define us. And so, again, God is saying change is possible. We, we, don't, we can't always blame it on the past generation. We can actually do something ourselves. So both Jeremiah and Ezekiel saw this is a pernicious doctrine. It led to a spirit of fatalism. And their responsibility. What can I do? You know, my parents did wrong. And so here am I. Uh, I'm just a, a hapless victim of my parents. And I have to do whatever uh, they did. 
And so um, that that's basically the argument. And so, again, we, we would say this, and again, this is our time is just about gone, but I want to just say this is very important. Although we're influenced by our upbringing, it does not have to define us. And I, I think it's important for you. People have got to come to this. You know, um, uh, my, my wife and I both uh, could testify to growing up in, in difficult, not exactly pristine Christian homes. Uh, and uh, and you have to make a decision. Am I going to let that just kind of be define who I am for the rest of my life? Or are we going to make a new start, a new beginning, a new household based on biblical truth? And everybody faces those choices. And so far from having a cause to blame their sinful ancestors for the present suffering, the exiles actually were more guilty than their fathers because they had sinned more and their idolatries were greater. And here's a proof of this. They're trying to blame it on their ancestors, but this is what Jeremiah 16, verse 11 and 12 says that puts completely to... Uh, the sword, as it were, their claim that their parents had had the influence upon them. So he says in Jeremiah 16, 11 and 12, Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law, and you, now notice this, have done worse than your fathers, for behold, you walk everyone after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. So he says, you know, yeah, you've been influenced by them, but you've actually done worse than they have. And the good news is, you don't have to do that. And that's what he's going to bring out in this chapter, but our time is definitely gone. And we will uh, look at this uh, chapter again next week, Lord willing, and we'll see that there's another pathway. And the other pathway is this. My past doesn't have to define me. In fact, I can have a bright, glorious future if I personally decide to follow God's ways. And that's the choice that everybody faces. What are you going to do with the truth of God? Are you going to take responsibility for your own actions? Are you going to follow what the word of God says? So our time is gone. May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.